Hey Collabers, I'm Ben Leroy. And I'm Jason Buckles. And you're listening to Collabracast. Hey Ben, you know, Mister Buckholtz, I'm doing I'm doing well. Uh, in my world right now, I've got some birds chirping on the outside. I've got blue skies. I've got temperatures in the 70s. We had absolutely oxygen stealing humidity over the weekend, and that is no longer there. So, no complaints except that my camera doesn't work. The lighting is crappy on this podcast and this microphone may or may not be working, but how is the weather there? I haven't stepped outside yet. It's a little early here today. Um, looks nice. Looks clear. Looks uh, somewhere lowish to mid 60s, I guess. Awesome. I'll have to pop out and see what's happening out there. Yesterday was very nice. It was uh, uh, not too hot, not too cold. Just kind of that that end of summer although it's not the end of summer but it kind of is because the kids go back to school tomorrow so it's we lamented this end of summer feel yeah we lamented this off the air why are kids going back to school in the beginning of august i don't know i don't understand it's just 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 creep just school year creep the pace of this new world with their refrigerators and their microwaves and their horseless carriages and whatnot it's too much it's a lot it's definitely a lot kids aren't happy about it <laughs> you know what <laughs> At least i one guess of i'm them not isn't. surprised <laughs> the kindergartner the in the inbound kindergartner is pumped the inbound eighth grader not so much but uh yeah we'll see how it goes big transition Little bit of housekeeping here. I want to thank everyone who participated in the free query letter review last week. It was great to see all of the people and all of the different books that are being worked on. And it's really, I have to confess this part. It is a lot more fun to work on query letters when they aren't query letters being sent to me as potential acquisitions. And they are instead just writers who are trying to capture people's attention, but knowing that I can be involved to do that the best that I can, and then have no more obligations. I'm not acquiring the book. I don't have to see the book through to publication. I don't have to talk about cover design. I don't have to talk about rights. That is really freeing and liberating to be able to do that. I look forward to doing it again in the future. I think people seem to be genuinely happy with it. We did a couple drafts back and forth in many cases. I was able to use BookScan to go get comp title sales reports so that people would know how to best position comp titles. It was It was a putting into action some of the things that we've talked about on previous episodes of CollaboraCast about how to write the best query letter and all of the little nuances and the doesn't make sense, but it is the way it is machinery of the publishing industry. So a lot of fun. Thank you again for those people who are participating. Also want to remind people that we are over on Patreon. We have not rolled anything out on the website, on our website on collaborist.org. Haven't pushed it out on social media yet. So basically the only people who know that we've got a Patreon are you, the collaborists in the Collaboracast audience. But want to remind you that there are a lot of really cool perks to be had over there. And uh, there's that. And then lastly, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice who may be interested in some version of workshop, residency, retreat in either Colorado or California, there are potentially existing opportunities. And 
If you may want more information, you can send an email to info at collaborist.org. That would be September for Colorado. That would be October for California. But send an email and let us know which version or both versions that you would be interested in more details and we will send. We are probably not going to be publicly putting this out there, but it's there. Again, this is just kind of a Collabracast exclusive news drop which is one more reason why you should be listening. And if you missed the free promo, the free query letter reviews, we are still doing those. We do those on an ongoing basis. They don't cost a whole lot. You get a great amount of value out of that. So if you happen to miss the promo window last week, that's fine. Shoot us a note anyway, and we'd be more than happy to look at your query letter and get you all that all that feedback for our our usual fee and uh we'll probably do another promo at some point down the line but um yeah don't if if you missed out well we got you we certainly do what is the topic of today's episode mr jason Today, we are continuing with our summer-long series on novel writing with, uh, so we're getting deeper into the actual craft of building the novel now. We've talked about our protagonists and antagonists and points of view and kind of all those big picture things. And today, we're getting into kind of some nuts and bolts, and this is going to go on for a few weeks, but today we're going to just cover the differences between scene and summary. And I'm sure that if you're listening to this, you've heard about the difference between showing and telling show. Don't tell is the old adage. And we're going to cover that, just cover what those are and how and when to use them or not. Um, And then that will, will set us up for next week when we take a deeper dive into scene building into all the elements that make up, make up scenes. Would you like to give an overview of what is meant by show, don't tell, or would you prefer that I do it? What works best for you? Yeah, let's hear what you've got. All right. The, and I'm condensing this because I believe that we'll go into it at length, but this is something that I have run into quite a bit over the years. It is one of those pieces of conventional wisdom that is spouted often, frequently. And it's also one that has a level of rigidity associated with it, where people are hyper vigilant in being able to point it out. This kind of goes in line with something that we may have already discussed in different episodes, but when people are like, you can't ever use an adverb for any reason whatsoever. And like, eh, yeah, kind of, but not really. Show, don't tell. Basically, the philosophy behind it is because we are writing and because we are trying to produce in the reader an evocative experience where they are in the scene so that they are completely slithering out of their everyday world and getting fully in 100% in the book, that giving information in summary, it was raining, it was hot, is a way of saying it was raining and it was hot. So we know what's happening. But if we said something like he was getting soaked as steam was rising off the pavement i'm doing a sloppy version here he was getting soaked while steam was raising off the pavement and there was an egg frying on the hood of the torino that had been parked in front of his neighbor's house for the last month that tells us that it's hot without saying it was hot it tells us that it was raining without specifically saying it was raining. And therefore the reader is engaging their mind and and engaging their imagination, which is an absolutely critical part in novel writing about getting the reader into the scene. So that's a very sloppy 30 second version of what we mean by show don't tell. Yeah, and I I think that's 
I don't think it's much more complicated than that. Um, it, it's a matter of pulling the reader into the scene and letting them experience and draw their own conclusions. And this has it has a lot to do with trusting the reader. And I think this is a common mistake that a lot of no, novice writers make. It's where they really want to make sure they're getting their point across. So they'll over explain it or they'll show it and then they'll tell it. One common way of doing this that I see is that they'll do a beautiful job of setting up a situation and having something happen. And then they'll tell you how the character felt. So let's say it's a, a, a war book and you've got some soldiers that are walking by and, and there's an IED, an explosion goes off. And then it might be tempting as a writer to say they were surprised. You can trust the reader to understand that that would be surprising. We all have imaginations. We're reading novels. We're choosing to immerse ourselves in these worlds. We're choosing to, to like you said, slither out of our everyday world and inhabit some other character's experience. We're doing that on purpose because we want to, it's enjoyable. And when we do that, we are, are putting ourselves into the author's world and experiencing all the things that are in it. And if a bomb goes off right next to us, we are, fortunately, most of us don't have a firsthand idea of what exactly that's like, but our imagination, our knowledge of the world steps in and presents us with an experience, with that experience on the page. So um, when you then put in, when, when a writer succumbs to the temptation to over explain, to tell what's happening, then it can be just a little bit of a it tips the writer's hand a little bit. It's it's that that suspension of disbelief. It's the illusion of the 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 world, the the fictional world. And when the writer, you can really sense that it's a thing that was written. So in that case, you can have a scene where you have an explosion and then you can experience that. And then when the writer says it, you know, it it was let's say it's a first-hand account and it says, I was very surprised. Um you at that point you as a reader can really sense the writer's hand in that and that messes a little bit with that illusion with the immersion i had a creative writing professor who talked about it as though you were watching a movie and there was someone sitting in the seat next to you and you're like fully into the movie and you, you know, your heart's racing. Here comes the horror movie. And then the person next to you is like, there's poison in that bottle right next to him. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I know. Like, why are, you, why are you telling me something that I know? And now you've pulled me out of this. Now I'm mad because I was fully surrendered to the story. And now I've got this thing on my shoulder being like, this is what's going on. No one wants to watch a movie with that person sitting on their shoulder in the same way that people won't want to read a book if every now and then, if it's a frequent thing of like, do, do you understand what's happening here right now? Like, this is what, stop, Just stop. Right, yeah, like your movie theater example, it pulls you out of the movie and back into the theater where you're sitting in that seat with, you know, your feet stuck to the ground with popcorn butter and, you know, your annoying friend who you wish you hadn't come to the movie with. Right. No matter how good, no matter how good the movie is. Um, right. So, yeah, I, I think that's a good example, but it's, it's, you know, tr trusting the reader has a lot to do with it. And it, it's as a reader, I would, much rather get the sense that the writer thinks too much of my intelligence <laughs> than talks down to me. I would rather, I would rather not quite fully understand things than have things over explained to me. Like I'm a third grader, which, which I need sometimes. Sure. Right. If I'm, you know, looking at a YouTube tutorial of how to fix my garbage disposal. Yeah. To, to, I'm, I'm, I'm assume I'm a third grader. But if I'm reading a novel and I'm fully immersed in your scene, then just just let me let me go. And it, and I don't have to get every single little thing 
Well, um, you know, hopefully I will, but. What a perfect example for you to bring up though. And the contrast between fiction and storytelling and words as instruction and nonfiction, like with the garbage disposal. Yes. Tell me, tell me, tell me everything. Don't just show me the video of what you're doing. Tell me like I'm a third grader, but that's the conveyance of how to knowledge which is a completely different form of word usage than storytelling. If you were going to tell me a wildly fantastic story about how there happens to be a whole civilization at the bottom of the garbage disposal, and every time you turn it on, it becomes like a natural disaster to them. It's this tornado blade that's coming through and cutting everybody up then maybe don't tell me about like, well, this is the steel part. And I, I, then I don't care. Like, I want to know about that. But as long as you're telling me how to fix something, I'm good with just tell me, just don't, don't shroud it in mystery and allegory and metaphor. Just tell me which parts I need and which screwdriver I'm going to get. Yep. Define every part. Don't assume that I know what the who's it is versus the what's it. Just, just break it down. Exactly. Um, your your movie theater example so i think so scene versus summary is a little bit different um it's 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 a related but similar dichotomy summary is in a sense a type of telling that is that's not bad that's that is necessary in some places it's the right way to convey information the difference between summary and scene are a, a summary is a way of writing a description of a lot of things happening in a short period of time, or I should say in a short space on the page. A scene is when you slow things down to real time. So whenever you have something like dialogue or sensory details, you're, you're writing a scene. Most most of most pages of most novels are going to be written in scene. They're going to be real time. They're going to be kind of cinematic where you see characters walking and moving and you see the, the setting that they're in. You hear they're, they're having conversations with other characters. Those are scenes. Summary is when something quickly happens. And I've got, I've got an example here. This is from this book that called the Bible that a few people maybe have heard of. So here's an example of summary. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. So there you have several centuries that go by in the span of two sentences. Noah Millennia, did all kinds of things. Almost. Yep. So, you know, as we all know, Noah did a few things in those 950 years. But in that one passage, it's just a quick summary of, of a lot of things going by. I was looking for other passages where, well, the, where, where in the Old Testament, they run through 10 different generations of a lineage. It's so-and-so sure. begat so-and-so, and then they begat this many people and that, and then they spread to here and there, and you've got, you know, another millennia and five or six generations of people who are begatten and then spread, and and you've got a lot of time going by. So here's an example of summary. This is um, just a little bit later in Genesis. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinat and settled there. Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So even though time is still moving relatively quickly, we are, you know, compared to that first passage when we've got a millennia going by in one sentence, we've got people in a specific place doing something specific. We have dialogue. They are doing something in, and we can imagine that. We can see that in real time. We can imagine ourselves there in the scene 
making those bricks, making that tower. Um, so that's that's the difference between summary and scene. So summary is not to be confused with telling, although they are not unrelated. I'm sure there's a, a Venn diagram that that has some overlap between the two of them. Summary is an important tool to use as, as you know, especially for my novels tend to unfold in in real time over the course of a summer or a winter. Um, at least so far. Others others will run through several generations. I've talked about 100 Years of Solitude. It takes place over several generations of a family over 100 years. You can't have a, a comprehensive catalog of scenes over 100 years. You're skipping by some people's big chunks of their lifetimes pretty quickly in a lot of examples. So, you know, the more time that your project is going to encompass, the more you're going to have to use summary to bridge those gaps between scenes. And scenes are what you want to use when you have something that is really pivotal to the plot, when there are heightened emotions, when there's something that you really need to slow down, you need to focus on a change in a character's fate or their feeling state, their understanding of the world but not every bit of your novel is going to be doing that kind of work. Sometimes you're just blocking the, you know, and I talked about blocking. Sometimes you just need to be moving characters around in the world and getting a kid through college so that he can go on to go do the next thing or whatever. If you're looking for a scene in the Bible while you're out there thumbing through it, I would recommend going to the book of Matthew and reading the Sermon on the Mount because <clears throat> now we've got Jesus in action, speaking to a crowd. We have, it, it's not a summary. It, it is real-time dialogue coming out. And so uh, just, I don't know how we veered off into using the Bible as a summary and scene tool but now that we're here i believe that we can do it in an effective way so that would just be ben's recommendation also my favorite part of the new testament is is the sermon on the mount so i always encourage people to read it when when possible and that begins uh, or that ends our our midweek sermon <laughs> So next time around, we will get, so the, the, we kind of quickly touched upon scene as something that unfolds in real time. There are all different ways to do that. And there are all different layers of reality that go into building an effective scene. And that's what we'll get to next week. I think that that is... The things that we're touching on this week are, are more of a refresher. I think that there are probably few people listening to this who haven't had some type of contact with these dichotomies before, with the difference between summary and scene, showing versus telling. Um, these are these are pretty basic techniques, but we wanted to set up a, a deeper dive into scenes and all the different layers and the and the different ingredients and and the ways in which you have to balance those all to be able to write an effective immersive scene. All right. So we'll get into more of that next episode. If you have found this episode helpful, or if you find the podcast in general helpful, please feel free to rate and review it wherever you get your podcasts, tell your friends about it. Do you have anything else that you would like to add Mr. Buckholtz? That'll do it. Thanks All for right. listening. For story. For community. Collaborators. <laughs>